Alright guys, this video I'm going to try and tackle another proof. This is a, an interesting proof, but it can be kind of confusing to understand. It's something I like to call limit exclusivity, meaning that a limit can only take one certain value. So what I'm trying to show is that if I have the limit as x approaches c of f of x, and I say that this limit is equal to one, L1, L sub 1, and I have the limit as x approaches c of f of x again, notice that these are the two exact same functions approaching the same c value, and I say this equals L2, I'm going to try and show you guys that L1 has to equal L2. There can only be one value for the limit. So again, let's start with what we know. For this limit on the left side, we know for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta, Now I'm going to call it a delta one greater than zero, you'll see why in such a second, such that when the absolute value of x minus c is greater than zero and less than delta one, then the absolute value of f of x minus l sub one, the value of my limit, is less than epsilon. And this follows directly from the definition. So if I'm to assume that this limit exists and it is, uh, and it is equal to l sub one, this follows right from that definition. So let's divide this down the middle and we're gonna write down what we know based on this limit. And it's almost the same for any epsilon greater than zero and I'm making a conscious decision to make these two epsilons the same. I'm allowed to do that because I can pick any epsilon value I want. Now here's the trick. There exists a delta sub two value greater than zero. Just because I pick the same epsilon doesn't mean they'll have the same delta. The fact that the limit exists let me know, lets me know that for any epsilon there is a delta, but it doesn't tell me that they're gonna be the, the exact same value. So I really don't know what these two delta values are. I just know that they exist such that when zero is less than x minus c, the absolute value is less than delta two now, then f of x minus L one, the absolute value is less than epsilon. Oh, and this should actually be L two because remember, if you look at the limit we wrote up here, we said the limit equals L2. And if you remember the overall proof, we're trying to show that L1 equals L2. So what does this mean? That means if we have some number line that kind of looks like this, and actually let me not draw it so much to one side because this implies to both of my limits because the C value that I'm using is actually the same for both of them. So if these is my, this is a set of X values, I have C right here. That means in some interval defined by delta one, so this is defined by delta one. This is actually gonna be C plus delta one, and this is gonna be C minus delta one. In this interval right here, if I pick X values inside that interval, except maybe at C, this inequality I know will be true. Now, similarly, I don't know what the size of delta two is. I'm gonna assume it's bigger, but it doesn't really have to be bigger. So I'm gonna call this delta two. I'm gonna say this is C plus delta two. In this interval right here, if I pick any x value in this interval, then this inequality right here will hold true. That's what I know by the definitions. Well, if you notice, the smaller of the two intervals fits inside the bigger interval. So if we were to look at just this interval, not only does this inequality hold true in that interval, we know that by this definition, but it turns out that this second inequality also holds true in that interval. Why? Because when we're inside this smaller interval, we're also inside this bigger interval. And there's no way of knowing whether delta two is gonna be bigger than delta one or delta one is gonna be bigger than delta two. I just did that as an example. But what we can say is that we know that there's some overall delta value that exists that is gonna be the minimum of delta one and delta two. Based on that, we can say that when zero is less than the absolute value of x minus c, which is less than delta. So we're defining that interval that contained both those intervals, the bigger interval and the smaller interval in it. When this is true, we know that this statement holds to be true. The absolute value of f of x minus L1 is less than epsilon. And we also know that the absolute value of f of x minus L2 is less than epsilon. Well, there's something we can do with this. So while we're in this interval, these two, two statements hold to be true. 
And also while we're in this interval, we can do a little bit of algebra to see how they relate. So what we can say is that in this interval, f of x minus L1, absolute value, plus the absolute value of f of x minus L2 is going to be less than 2 epsilon. And this is where it gets kind of tricky. So I'm going to erase some things and rewrite the important parts up top. So we can take another look at this. So we're saying while 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, while that statement holds true, we're saying that f of x minus L1 plus the absolute value of f of x minus L2 is going to be less than 2 epsilon. So we're going to take a look at this inequality right here. And what we're able to say, and this comes with a bit of algebra, which I'll explain in just a second, is that the distance between L1 and L2, or the absolute value of the difference between them, is going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of f of x minus L1 plus the absolute value of f of x minus L2. And you might be wondering, well, where is that inequality coming from? It's pretty e easy to realize why this is true if we just look at a number line. We really have two big scenarios. I'm going to put f of x somewhere on this number line. For some value of f, or for some value of x, f of x will be somewhere on the number line. L1 will be set either on one side or the other, and L2 will be set either on one side or the other. And the key is they'll either be on the same side of f of x or on a different side. So I've drawn them on different sides this time, and I'm going to draw one more number line where they're on the same side. And I want you to take a look at the two expressions we have. So the first expression is the distance between f of x and L1 plus the distance between f of x and L2. In this scenario, we can say that we can see the two distances, and we can see if we add them together, they're equal to the distance between L1 and L2. In our second scenario, we can see the two distances, and we also see, and it's this, we also see if we add them together, it's greater than, just like this inequality says, greater than the distance between L1 and L2. Because the distance between the one that's farther out from f of x actually encompasses that distance between L1 and 2, and then adds some more. So we know, based on these two scenarios, these are the only two options you have. You can test all the different combinations that this statement will always hold true. Well, what does that let us know? That lets us know that when we pick x values in this interval, that 2 epsilon is greater than this, uh, this expression right here, and this expression is greater than or equal to the distance between L1 and L2. That lets us know, then, that 2 epsilon is greater than the distance between L1 and L2 when we're picking x values in the interval. And this is what's interesting, because epsilon, as we defined, we can pick any epsilon value we want we will always be able to find a delta value. That's based on the definition of these limits. So regardless of what epsilon value we pick, we'll always be able to find a delta value. We'll always be able to make the, these series of equations true. That means we can pick an epsilon value that's getting closer and closer to zero. And remember, this statement, because the delta value always exists, this statement always has to be true for any epsilon value, even if it gets closer and closer to zero. And the only way that this statement can be true as epsilon gets infinitely close to zero is if the absolute value of L1 minus L2 is equal to zero. And that implies that L1 is equal to L2. So based on that, we just showed that limits are exclusive. That if the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to L sub 1, and the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to L sub 2, these L sub 1 and L sub 2 have to be equal. The limits have their own specific value. You can't have two values for the same limit.